Hello, and welcome to the Books Uncovered podcast, a podcast brought to you by Fulcrum Publishing, where we explore the world of books and the people who make up the publishing and the book industry. I'm Sam Shinta, publisher of Fulcrum Publishing, and I'm joined by my co-host, Kateri Kramer, Fulcrum's marketing director. Hello, Kateri. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Great. Uh, we are officially kind of ending our summer break here with the podcasts. Uh, have you had a nice summer? Yeah, it's been really good. We've um, gotten outside a lot, which is nice, and um, lots of good things in the book world. So it's been wonderful. I'm not ready for it to end. Yet. I know. I know. That's yeah. always the hardest part. It's like, how can we extend this summer yeah, as exactly. much as possible? Yeah. Well, summer is obviously the time where people travel. And I think this this summer has been a record travel summer for the United States, or at least bringing things back to pre-pandemic times. And uh, when when I was thinking about travel, I was thinking, of course, of our author today and the the the, the, the materials we're going to be talking about, and this whole idea of uh, this cosmopolitanism, this idea of global citizenship. And so I was curious because I know you've done some international travel. Where was that first place you traveled that it really hit you that we're part of this bigger world and that we're all connected? That this whole you know the notion of interconnectedness of peoples. Yeah, I think um, I my parents had us traveling a lot when we were kids. Um, but I think the first time that it like really occurred to me was like over a period of time when I was in high school, we uh, had a foreign exchange student from Rome who lived with us for quite a mm. while. Um, and then when I graduated high school, we went to Rome to visit him. And I think that that was kind of the first time that I realized like, families are like made up similarly. Like I remember sitting with his family and feeling very at home. Like, even though I couldn't understand what they were saying, it felt like I was there with my grandparents just and aunts and uncles and like the way they bantered and made fun of each other and all mm. the food and that kind of thing. And that interconnectedness was always, um, really, really interesting to me. And then, I mean, to this day, like we'll go visit him every couple of years or he'll come here. And it's like, we have spent no time apart, despite like how physically far apart we've been and for what a period of time. Yeah. How about you? Uh, for, well, I didn't do a lot of travel when I was young. And so I started making that up in my twenties and I had the, the fortune of going to Hong Kong in mm. 1997 before it was uh, turned back over. Uh, and I remember uh, flying into the airport. It was at, at the time, the airport was actually on the big Island. They've since moved it to a peninsula that they basically oh. like, made out of nothing. Um, but you landed at this airport and it was about five in the morning. It was one of those all night flights and we landed and it was really foggy and still dark and really eerie. But then you, at the time you exited the plane, instead of going into a jetway, you exited and walked outdoors and then got back in and looking around. And there were dozens of planes from all over the world. And I mean, every single plane was from a different country and everybody was coming to Hong Kong either to disembark there or as a stopover to the next place. And just looking around and going, oh my gosh, like that airline in that country and that airline in that country. And this whole idea of all these people converging, it just was this weird, almost surreal feeling that just took me out of, of where I was. And, and of course, you're kind of groggy and tired already. It was, wow, wow we are like, all connected. We are all part of this and everybody seems to be coming here right now for whatever magical reason. So uh, well, our author today has has thought a lot about this topic of, of this whole idea of cosmopolitanism, of, of world citizenship and interconnectedness in her writing and most recent uh, the most recent book that she's done. Uh, we're joined today by Adrian Kalfapulu, who is a poet, essayist, and scholar based in Athens, Greece, where she is joining us from today. Uh, she has authored three poetry collections and two collections of essays, most recently, On the Gaze, Do Dubai and its new cosmopolitanisms, a thought-provoking exploration of Dubai's evolving cultural landscape. Adrian has taught internationally at institutions of higher education in Athens, Freiburg, Edinburgh, and now the United Arab Emirates, and served as a faculty member in the low-residency, mile-high MFA program at Regis University. 
She held the position of McGee Distinguished Professor of Creative Writing at Davidson College during the 2020-2021 academic year. Welcome, Adrian Kalfapulu. How are you today? Hi, thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much for this beautiful publication. <laughs> ah, yes, on the gaze. So uh, let's let's start with talking about the book. Why, what motivated you to write about Dubai? I know you were spending time there and teaching there, but what, what about Dubai really struck your interest? Well, what you just said, Sam, about the Hong Kong airport is such a good descriptor for the Dubai airport. Um, it is a place, it's a crossroads, it's a hub, it's a um, passageway. And what was fascinating as I started researching for this uh, book-length essay was the idea of trade and movement is something that is indigenous to the Gulf states. I mean, this is what the Gulf uh, states, which were kingdoms, sheikhdoms, you know, they were uh, tribal communities, um, which were run by the sheikh. And um, after the British basically pulled these groups together under what they called a protectorate system, um, because these were also considered private uh, pirate states, excuse me. Um, but when I say that word, I'm thinking of my other part of the title, which is the gays. And I'm thinking they were pirate states through the British gaze, <laughs> uh, you know, they may not have considered themselves pirate states, you know, prior to the British presence. And of course, the British wanted this kind of peace and passageway because it was a perfect shortcut to India, uh, which was their colony at the time. So writing about Dubai, um, I was, as you describe your own experience in the Hong Kong airport, I just thought, wow, this is some place totally different from anything I've ever known. And I have traveled. Uh, my family, I was born in Southeast Asia, uh, spent some time in Thailand, uh, you know, grew up uh, in different places in Switzerland for a while, and then ended up in Connecticut in the US. So for me to say that Dubai was like a completely different place <laughs> was something that surprised me too. And, you know, and it's to me, it's fascinating because we, we, you and I've talked about this when you were first thinking about this book uh, or this essay that uh, it is it is a kind of a commercial crossroads and a cultural crossroads, but it's also this meeting of east and west in and yes. blending in many respects too. That there's yep. a conservatism to Dubai, but also for lack of a better word, almost like a hedonism that is happening there. This this consumerism and the the indoor ski slopes and the the beaches made out of nothing and all of that. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, a kind of excessiveness and uh, yeah, a better word than hedonism. Yeah, excessiveness. I like that. Yeah, it's 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 a it's you know it's a very interesting interface between sort of you know I want to say capitalism on speed on some level. Uh, but at the same time, uh, this very traditional underpinning of a culture that comes out of its um, of its tribal past with very particular values that maintain themselves within this kind of hyper consumerist culture. Um, so I find that really interesting. It, it sounds almost like an opposition or a paradox, but when I started researching and writing the book, I realized one of, the, one of the big sort of eureka moments for me was that how the trade culture to exist in its early days as when these were Bedouin tribes, right, in the desert, uh, it was um, through trade and transactional exchanges in which people, um, you know, agreed on what they were going to be trade, trading, the goods that they were trading, how they were going to trade these goods. And it's sort of, you know, for one of a, it sounds a little bit simplistic, but I feel like, oh, this is the beginning of free, of fair trade, mm. you know, the fair trade movement uh, within the tribal past of, of Bedouin cultures. And that ethos is still very uh, apparent uh, there. And so while uh, in many ways, Dubai has gotten a kind of bad rap, um, a lot of people have reached out to me wanting to talk about the issue of human rights. And while that's is uh it is a, a subject um 
it's it's way reductive just to just to say it within a kind of Western packaging of that term, because when I looked up, you know, where do the workers live who are mainly South Asian uh, individuals, um, there are certain um, parameters that are put out by the Ministry of Labor, uh, of which which include that all the spaces, the rooms have to be air conditioned. There has to be a space uh, prayer room. Uh, there has to be, um, you know, good hygiene uh, there because this is also part of uh, Islamic um, culture. Uh, hygiene is a is a very important part of that culture. You go into a into a house, you take off your shoes. Uh, you don't walk into a space where people live with your shoes. You leave them at the entranceway. So, um, so while yes, there is this excess and this kind of kind of surreal thing like an ice skating rink in the mall and um, so forth. Um, at the same time, there's a real kind of respect for the visitor. Yeah, and I absolutely love that 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 idea. And again, if you, I, I think you hit something really important. If you study Islamic culture and history, you do see this tradition of cosmopolitanism that has been going back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And yet, for some reason, we're it's kind of surprised in the 21st century that, oh, my gosh, Dubai seems to be d- blending all of these things and bring them together. And it's like, no, this has been part of this movement, because, again, the trading that took place and the fact that they were facilitating not just trading of goods, but trading of ideas. And, and yes. so when you look at that, that Islamic high culture in the, what, 11th, 12th, 13th centuries and, and the what happened out of that, what generated out of it was incredibly cosmopolitan. So I, I love that you're framing this in, in this particular way and, and giving this a lot of due. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was something that was very important to me because, you know, in a more superficial way, uh, obviously Dubai has also been compared as people have said to kind of a, a, a Middle Eastern Las Vegas, uh, but, but because of the desert, uh, because of, you know, the fact that there is, um, you know, so much going on and it's, there's so much of the consumerist excesses there, but it really isn't, you know, it really isn't um, because um, it's not a place where there's gambling, for example, unless you want to talk about trade in the larger context of a just of a gamble right uh but 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 the, let's say the players are are individuated like they're individuals who are having a discussion uh trying to come to an agreement my own experience there on my sort of very you know kind of individual uh level uh everything is a discussion and it's not so much it's really interesting because i come with my western head and it's like okay so let's get to the solution like what are we going to do about this um, and sometimes I feel, you know, are, why are we spending so much time discussing something? But the discussion is really important. And that's how relationships are forged. Mm-hmm. So so that's anti-capitalist in a way, if you'd like. I mean, it's like the individual doesn't get erased in the transaction is, I guess, my point. Yeah, I really like that. And I think that like plays into this other side of the book, which is maybe the other half of the idea of the gaze and looking and observing and like taking that time before anything else happens, the like thought process and the processing behind it all. How did you decide to make that such a big part of the book? That's a great question, Katarian. Thanks for thanks for that, because I really wanted to address this idea of the gaze because I'm not Muslim. Uh, I'm not part of the Middle East. I'm a visitor, a foreigner in the view of, you know, those who are uh, indigenous to the culture, obviously. So I did not want that part of it not to be uh, addressed. Mm -hmm. And that's really the main part of it, you know, in the sort of honesty of this. How do we observe those who are not like ourselves? And here I was immersed in a place that was totally other to me on all levels, culturally, religious, um, you know, uh, racially. So, you know, there was no way I could start to engage with this without understanding that I am looking and observing uh, as somebody who is viewing another, uh, Mm -hmm. all right, as other. 
Um, so, so that was very intriguing to me. And I thought that that had to be kind of front and center. Yeah. Um, this idea of the gaze, uh, how do we look at, at, at a culture or a, or a space that is uh, unfamiliar to us. And of course that immediately kicks in with issues of projection. How do we project our own assumptions? And then I, I really stumbled on the, 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 the theoretical underpinnings of that in Jean Baudillard's discussion of the simulacrum, but ours also Mark Auge, who just recently passed, the anthropologist who you know, talks about non-places and coined the term non-places, right? Um, but this idea of the simulacrum became really key to the discussion because this is what Dubai, what its rulers, uh, particularly uh, Sheikh, uh, 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 the Maktoum family, uh, which was uh, Sheikh uh, Rashid, um, uh, Bin Al Maktoum from the 19, like 1958 when he first came into um, reign. From that point on, he really um, projected his own vision onto the desert of what he would like, you know, Dubai to become. And so the gaze is my gaze and what I'm learning. And it's also how does the desert itself invite a gaze, right? Because it's a kind of tabula rasa uh, where we you know, look upon it. And in this case, that that's precisely what happened, you know, out of the desert came this um, super city. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, what I really appreciate is that, like, I think in a lot of spaces, we, we hear the word or the idea of the gaze. And like, at least for me, I'm going back to John Berger's stuff oh, with yeah. the gaze. And then I think there's some some maybe subconscious like negative side effects with that, that like you're immediately thinking that observing and like having this personal idea that's being projected on something else is, is negative. But I think that in your book, you really teach us that we can like learn from that and it can change our perspective if we, if we process all the way through all of that. And it becomes this really like positive learning experience where that gaze is, uh, it, it impacts the way that we interact and in, in this new world uh, that we're, we're now like with you living in. Um, did you have any like change where maybe there was a pejorative idea behind the gaze and observation and did that change at all? Or did you start out kind of knowing that that was a positive and beneficial experience? No, no, no. I was very uncomfortable, um, you know, immediately, actually, uh, in a sense of my difference and very um, conscious and self-conscious about um, how do I move in a space that's unfamiliar to me without, you know, unbeknownst to myself, perhaps, um, you know, being disrespectful in some way, you know, like I, I was really worried about that because my whole apparatus is a Western structural apparatus. Um, and for all our discussion of inclusivity, what was so fascinating to me when I became more immersed in the Middle Eastern culture and particularly Islamic traditions is that, you know, the recognition that we're not the same, that we're in fact different, and the sense of community is built on an acknowledgement of difference as opposed to the assumption that we are all uh, doing the same thing. And what's interesting about Dubai's cosmopolitanism is it seems to address that. It's not a cosmopolitanism that sort of uh, merges difference as much as it tears it. And that's also part of the critique right because you have a tiered cosmopolitanism you have a cosmopolitanism from the from the top as we say which is the privileged and then there's the cosmopolitan homi baba discusses this of the, from the from the bottom right the cosmopolitan that comes up when workers are put together uh, who did not choose to be together they're not tourists right they're working together they're trying to make a living uh, or even myself you know teaching in an environment where we have different um, points of reference and discussing ways to approach certain things in an academic environment and, and not necessarily always understanding 
even though we're using the language and we understand the language, but it's the cultural input where the differences come up. So, yeah. in a, you know, the hospitality, the, the notion of hospitality as, a, as, a, as an ethos that, that makes space for the other as other was really interesting to me. Yeah. I'm wondering too, like, did, did this process for you actually start earlier with, um, I guess I should preface this by saying like the, w- did Ruin come out right before On the Gaze or was there one in between, a book in between? Yeah, there was a poetry book in between, okay. uh, History of Too Much that dealt oh, with the right. great, you know, crisis, the meltdown yeah. with the financial yeah. But Ruin came out just before that. And yeah, that had a lot to do with, um, some of that had to do, or, or the work I was doing with refugees was my first kind of more intimate introduction to cultures different from my own. Well, and it's interesting too, because like Athens then becomes this convergence of where like refugees are traveling to for a safe place, but then you are in your own environment and having this, this gaze experience working with people of a different culture, which were, were most of the individuals coming in like Arab Afghan. Afghan. Okay. Yeah. So you're like already having this like middle East interaction with people like years before you're going to Dubai. Did that, did that gaze process there like inform what happened in Dubai in your thought process there? Well, it's really interesting because I mean, the answer is yes, in that I got interested in in, in Islamic cultures mm. through my um, you know, uh, work with the refugee communities. But what, what's really interesting is, you know, within the refugee communities, obviously the people are disenfranchised and uh, traumatized. Um, so then you go to a place like Dubai and you find uh, people in, you know, economically privileged positions, right, doing really well. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm the one, you know, sort of economically sort of on the lower end of the scale, let's say. Um, and so it was really interesting. I was just at a conference on Leros, which was fascinating, the humanism conferences that are, uh, that is uh, sponsored by Columbia University. And uh, Neni Panutya, who you know was, is one of the people who blurred the book, um, and it was so interesting because a, a, a paper was given by um, um, a Pakistani uh, person, a man from Pakistan, a professor from Pakistan, and he was saying, you know, he was doing a lot of work with uh, Pakistan refugees, Pakistani refugees in Athens, and you know, I went up to him afterwards and I said, you know, it's really interesting because my my classroom, when I go into my classroom. I'm dealing with, you know, I have a lot of Indian, Pakistan, uh, Pakistani students, uh, South Asian students, a lot from people from Iraqi students, Syrian, and and then I come to Greece, and I see that the Pakistani population are doing really uh, menial labor intensive, uh, and they're and they're discriminated against. There's racist, um, you know, horrendous racism against these groups in Athens, and it's really amazing to it's a it's a sort of talk about a gaze you know I mean I'm just like recalibrating I'm the teacher in a classroom I'm the minority I'm white I'm a woman um and then I come to Greece and I'm part of the I'm part of the you know the 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 group that is hosting let's say um those those uh groups who are coming in who are in much more disenfranchised positions so it's really it's a really interesting shift, you know, that, um, that, that relationship to the other, you know, uh, in these two different cultures. You, you said something uh, quite beautiful and, and, and quite profound. Uh, and, and I just want to make sure to, to call it out. This whole idea that hospitality that makes place for the other as the other. And and this whole idea that Dubai, when we first talked about this project, this notion of Dubai as a crossroads in the 21st century, and the fact that they're exemplifying this idea that they're taking people as they are and, and making space, in th- that metaphorical table, right, for people as they are with their, their culture, with, with their interest, not trying to blend as much as acknowledge the common humanity or a space for that common humanity and and then to to just still recognize that there's this diversity of of experience and culture there i, I think that's just quite a beautiful idea 
Yeah, I mean, that's definitely what Dubai uh, represents and, you know, uh, sees itself as, um, you know, and, and, it, and I think it was that way from the beginning, you know, it's, um, you know, we're in an, we're in an Arab kingdom, um, you know, and as soon as you're using the word kingdom, you're, you're talking about a tiered society. But within that tiered society, there's this effort and acknowledgement that we need everybody within that space uh, to make it mm -hmm. work. And, you know, I mean, it's we can think about the ancient past. We can think about Rome. We can think about Greek antiquity. Um, you know, the, the idea of a, of, a, of a structured society. Um, you know, we talk about ancient Greece as democratic. Well, well, it's not, it wasn't, not in the terms that we <laughs> yeah. speak about, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah, we tend, we tend to forget that women and slaves were not included. <laughs> Indeed. Well, there you go. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And not that we want to recreate that system, uh, mm -hmm. but I'm just saying that, you know, when you're talking about versions of tiered societies, uh, I think that's part of, I, I mean, I'm going to say this, uh, part of Western hubris that we just assume that this is this is the only way to do it, and obviously we're all living uh, a very um, you know fraught time within our democratic spaces, uh, and and in a way that has helped me you know I being in being in Dubai, being in the Middle East, you know being in an is, in an Islamic culture really has shifted my own gaze on the West. Um, you know, not that I was bereft of critiques for it <laughs> before I went. <laughs> but nevertheless, you know, I have to say that this notion of hospitality, and I'm glad, Sam, you 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 pull, pull that out too, because the notion of hospitality is basically acknowledges that we don't always get to a solution or we don't always get to this ideal. And, you know, our our kind of assumption of that we must have the ideal or nothing is quite destructive in some ways. Yeah, it's, I mean, uh, yeah, talk about a lesson that we can all benefit from, this whole idea of welcoming people who are different-minded than us is, is so important, and it just seems to be something that is so lacking right now, that we don't want to make that space at the metaphorical table for somebody who thinks differently, who has a different background, who has maybe different assumptions of their uh, of, of right. how life should be lived. And, and yes. hospitality is really grounded in the fact that, no, that's exactly the, the one you should be welcoming because it expands your worldview. It, it forces you to, to look broader. It is truly cosmopolitan. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of my students uh, from Kerala, India, she, was, she brought it up. Like we have these discussions in class and some of these discussions are really tough for me. Um, you know, I try to make it a space where we can share um, you know, and I try not to impose, you know, anything of what I might think is the is the better system, let's say. And, you know, she was pointing out we were talking about Dubai and she said, you know, it's not the the democracy that, you know, we see in the West, but it works. And that were that those were her words. Right. She says, you know, there seems to be a kind of um, stability, let's say. All right. And, you know, I mean. We could we can we could talk a lot about the the things that don't work, but but that's sort of in, in that case the balancing is more or less equal because because of you know you know you can't go around with guns in Dubai for example unless you're the military or the police right. Well, you have given us a truly a, a beautiful essay and a lot to think about. And and I, I just think a, 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 a significant contribution to the literature on this topic. So I, I really do encourage people to read it, not just to understand Dubai, but to understand these bigger themes of, you know, how we all connect, interconnectedness, cosmopolitanism, the gays. Uh, and you just, it, what, what is just remarkable to me in this essay is you do so much in 25,000 words and, and cover a lot of history, a lot of culture, a lot of different ideas, and really provoke the reader to think. So thank you so much for this beautiful book. Well, thank you for bringing it into the world. <laughs> there it you. is again. Well, this is now the, the fun part where we get to talk about books that we are loving. Uh, and and every time we we do this, we talk about, we tie it back to our theme. So what we're looking for now are books that explore or promote global understanding or and or interconnectedness. 
And so, Adrian, we're going to start with you. I, you have a, a wonderful selection for this. Um, the books that I are that I'm reading or that I would consider. Um, well, you know, I go back to books that I've read before. And I'm actually I'm going to talk about poetry because I think that the poetry that I've been reading, you know, like Zaina Hashem Beck's uh, book, uh, O, uh, which is this book. Mm -hmm. And it's just she's um, uh, Lebanese. Uh, um, and she now lives in California, but she was in Dubai actually for, for a decade, if not more. And that's a book that I taught my students and they were really excited about it because they could connect to her sense of cosmopolitanism. Mm -hmm. And she really has such a reach uh, in the poems. Um, so I'm, I'm seeing this kind of sense of the global in, in a lot of poetry that I've been reading, but also essays. Like there's another book that, uh, um, it's an older book, but it's a great book. It's called Letters of Transit. And it's, um, you know, essays with um, Eva Hoffman, Mukherjee, Edward Said, Charles Schimmick, Schimmick. And so these are, you know, people who travel. So I, I, I really like travel books and I like poetry, uh, essays and poems a lot because I think they're trying, they're, they're more idea based in some sense, it, it, obviously essays. Excellent, excellent suggestions. Uh, yeah, well, uh, definitely, I wrote them both down. <laughs> so looking forward to those. How about you, Kateri? Um, so I went a little out of the box, not in terms of the question, but in terms of the format. And my head has been firmly in children's book world right now. So I actually chose a children's oh, book. Oh, um, that's and, great. Yeah, it's by my favorite illustrator. Her name is Rebecca Green. Um, and the book is by Kate Baker, but it's called, it's a place called home. And the book basically goes through like all of these different countries and like what home might look like for a different person there. And it covers like lots of different regions and there's like flaps in the book. So you can like peek inside oh, and, like, fantastic. how people like oh, might play differently great. or eat differently. Um, and I just really like the idea of like introducing this to young people really early on um, that like everybody has a home and they look different, but it's like, we all kind of ideally have the same feeling when we're there. Um, it's safe and supportive and our family is nearby and like that kind of thing. So that was oh, my that's fantastic. wonderful, a very yeah. fun book. How about I you? Love it. So I, I I struggled with this one because my first instinct was, of course, to go to nonfiction, and 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 so you yeah, yeah, okay, I could I could do Edward Said's Orientalism, which is a very influential book, or the the kind of the counterbalance Baruma and Margalit's uh, Occidentalism, which was kind of the response to to Orientalism and looking at it the from the other side. But then I I thought about it, and and like you, I I thought, okay, well maybe I just need to go to a different format here, and I thought about this very loose trilogy that I, I've read over the past couple of years that I absolutely love. The, the series of books from Emily St. John Mandel, Station Eleven, The Glass Hotel, and The Sea of Tranquility. Uh, these wow. are all loosely connected. And what happens is there's one character that kind of weaves into each one. And they're all on independent topics uh, the the uh, station eleven is about post apocalyptic a post apocalyptic world and how do the arts survive? The glass hotel is about a seemingly unrelated incidents of a, a work of graffiti and a Ponzi scheme that's falling apart. And then Sea of Tranquility is this time travel story. But what links them all is this notion of the interconnectedness of people and geography. And wow. she just does a beautiful job. Her writing is just stellar. Uh, I, I, I quickly went and bought all of her books after I read these three, but it, these are books that have just stayed with me, not just the, the characters and the, the themes. And I don't want to spoil too, because these are books that really deserve to be read and, and revealed along the way, but also the deep themes that she is, is really wrestling with here, metaphysics and, and how we connect and, and what is the, what is the nature of art? What survives when, and we we all go away and and mm -hmm. how do we care for each other i mean these are all kind of tied in her books and she just does it beautifully well so i would highly recommend uh, these books for a better understanding of humans and how we all connect nice fantastic 
Well, this has just been wonderful and 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 just a great intellectual journey. Uh, Adrian, you've just given us, I said, a gift in this in this lovely oh. essay. I do hope people go out and read this. They will learn more, not just about this amazing and fascinating place called Dubai, but again, about so many other bigger themes. So please check out On the Gaze, Dubai and its new cosmopolitanisms by Adrian Kalpapulu. Uh, Adrian, thank you so much again for joining us from Athens. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Kateri. Thank you again. Thank you, Fulcrum. <laughs> well, thank you so much and happy reading. If you enjoyed this episode, we would love for you to rate and subscribe to Books Uncovered so that others can also discover and enjoy. Thank you for being a part of the Books Uncovered community, where book communities come alive.